Hello, thank you all for joining us today. We'll get started in a few minutes after giving folks time to log in. We recorded this session in early December, a few days before our esteemed panelist, Deb Holland of New Mexico received President-elect Biden's nomination to lead the Department of Interior. As you will hear in this session, Representative Holland has worked tirelessly to advocate for social justice, our public lands and waters. We are honored to have her participation in Outdoor Retailer this year. Thank you all for joining. We're going to get started in just a moment. We're giving folks time to log in. Thank you all for joining. We're going to get started in just a moment. We're giving folks time to log in. Good afternoon, everyone. We're excited to have you join this conversation at Outdoor Retailer Online. My name is Stephanie Maez, and I'm the Managing Director of the Outdoor Foundation, where we are working with communities to help make the outdoors accessible for all. By connecting research, people, and programs, the Thrive Outside Initiative is inspiring the outdoor habit in kids and families from diverse communities across the country. Joining me here today is Congresswoman Deb Holland of New Mexico. Congresswoman Holland is 35th generation New Mexican and an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Laguna and has Jemez Pueblo heritage. She's also my Congresswoman. Lesford Duncan, Senior Director of Programs at Outdoor Outreach in San Diego, California. Mike Nope, Executive Director of the Oklahoma City Boathouse Foundation. Matthew Millspa, Assistant Division Chief at California Department of Parks and Recreation and Axie Navas, Executive Director of the New Mexico Office of Outdoor Recreation. During today's discussion, we will focus on how public policy can help increase outdoor participation in diverse communities and how increasing outdoor participation in turn supports passing good public policy. All of which has benefits to our communities in areas such as youth development, environmental policy and stewardship, overall health and well-being, and many more. I'll be asking each of our panelists questions that pull on their background and experience in this space. But really this is a dialogue and I'm not a moderator in a traditional sense. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Congresswoman Holland, in addition to being one of the first two Native American women to serve in Congress, you serve in several leadership roles. 
as vice chair for the U.S. House Committee on Natural Resources and full chair of the House Subcommittee on National Parks and Forests and Public Lands, you have a unique perspective as well as influence. Your work on the Outdoors for All Act, SOAR Act, and the Great American Outdoors Act focus on increasing equity and inclusivity and access to the outdoors. What other policy opportunities, legislatively or in working with the incoming administration, do you see on the horizon that will support efforts to expand outdoor access, particularly with Black, Indigenous, and people of color? Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. And good afternoon to everyone. It's nice to see all of you. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this important and timely discussion about our environment, about our public lands, about public policy that is meant to protect those lands. And of course, uh, about our kids' future because that's who we need to protect our public lands for. Um, thank you for coordinating this event. And uh, I look forward to, to hearing from all of the panelists. So, um, so look, I, I, I feel like, um, you know, when I think about mo moving us into the future, um, you know, uh, making sure that we can urge uh, more of our fellow Americans of color to access the outdoors. Um, for one, I use my experience as a Pueblo woman. Uh, I was raised to connect to the earth. I mean, I've spent countless hours uh, down at the cornfield with my grandfather learning about, uh, you know, uh, bug, bu learning about bug control without using pesticides, you know, picking the worms off of ears of corn and, and learning about the irrigation systems and, and why it's important to protect our water. So I've spent so much time as a kid learning about those things. Um, my dad was raised on a farm. And so he also, uh, I get the agriculture side from his side of the family as well. Uh, the bottom line is both sides of my family, both my parents were uh, steeped in, in uh, what it was like to be in nature. And, and they passed that on to us uh, to be observant, to be mindful of the impacts that we make on our outdoors every day and also enjoy it so much that you want to be outdoors and you want everyone else to have those experiences as well. Um, as a New Mexican, um, so many of us, that's our life, spending time outdoors. Um, but look, without proper federal funding, without folks in, in the decision-making areas who are uh, making decisions on funding and regulations and all of these things, um, we, 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 the, our, that task becomes a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, the Great American Outdoors Act, I, I was so happy to uh, get that legislation passed, um, making sure that the Land and Water Conservation Fund was, uh, became permanent, pushing the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature. These are all things that I think will assist um, not only uh, New Mexicans, but people across the country. Um, we want more kids to be out in nature. We want everyone to feel welcome, uh, you know, in talking about place names as well. Uh, we, we want to make sure that, um, that people who are seeking solace of, of our environment um, can get that in every way, shape and form. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Um, folks, folks on the panel, do you have any follow-up questions for the Congresswoman or comments to add? One, one thing I think about when we have these conversations is, you know, particularly for, for you, Congress, Congresswoman, how can interested stakeholders really help in that process to, to see policy proposals become real and to ensure funding is, is sustained long-term, supporting efforts with, you know, for, for folks like you that are championing this in, in the legislative space? Well, most definitely, uh, you know, pu public opinion means a tremendous amount. And uh, so when we see that polling has shown that 73% of voters in Western states support our 30 by 30 resolution to save nature, that means a tremendous amount to us. And we want that 73% of voters to voice that support on social media, 
in letters that they're writing to their Congress people and in, in, in just in getting more support so that we can move those important initiatives forward. Um, we've heard testimony in my subcommittee that protecting unaltered ecosystems is important for ensuring species can adapt to climate change. Uh, sportsmen and anglers have also had seats um, in our committee room uh, talking about making, they wanna make sure that species um, you know, have the habitat to live in. And so they are also um, intent on conserving 30% of our land and oceans by 2030. And I, I'll just say that stakeholders really need to consider that our economy is significant in the success of, of this venture and many other ventures. So the policies um, that we're putting forth, uh, they provide an opportunity to create new jobs in this restorative economy. Uh, one where we're working to protect our planet from falling off the precipice of this climate crisis. And it's also critical for New Mexicans um, because we're all going to be recovering from the economic impacts of the pandemic. So we want every person in our economy to have opportunities to, um, in wherever they're working, we want their opportunities to be there so that we can all real rebuild our economy. Absolutely, it sure is a group group initiative. I, I realized as I was asking my follow-up question that I first put it to the panel and then I took the opportunity to take that question. So I'll pause here and see if anybody else has any responses to that specific topic. Absolutely, I could, I, I could definitely chime in. And first I'll, I'll start by saying Congresswoman Holland, the, the impact of your work, both on the Great American Outdoors Act, as well as the Outdoors for All Act, um, definitely has a tremendous ripple effect across, across our country. Um, for us at Outdoor Outreach, uh, a local nonprofit here based in San Diego, uh, many of the youth that have gone through our programs, many of whom had their first most impactful experiences in the outdoors, whether it be at our coast or in our mountains, whether it be rock climbing in Joshua Tree um, National Park or tide pooling at Cabrillo National Monument. Many of those youth have had their, their initial formative experiences in the outdoors through programs like ours, and then became champions or advocates for those, for those spaces um, thereafter. And so the, out, the Outdoors for All Act is one example of, the, of uh, one of the, the pieces of legislation that our, our youth really championed. I remember um, a group of our leadership program participants going to meet with uh, Congressman Mike Levin and having a really robust conversation there about why not only protecting these outdoor spaces and protecting the environment is so critical, but opening those environments also for, for youth to be able to recreate, to experience the health, the well-being, um, the resilience effects of being in the outdoors and, and really being one uh, with nature. And so that, that's been tremendously impactful. Another key piece of that legislation also, and I, I so appreciate um, that being incorporated into the legislation is around youth employment and job training, right? So as, as we look at how do we make, how, how do we create a more diverse outdoors? Um, part of it also starts with, you know, how are we, how are we um, representing communities of color in those outdoor spaces as well. And so that, that comes about through having diverse workforce pipeline programs um, like, like the ones that are supported through this legislation. And so um, I'm, I'm giving my testimony from, you know, from the boots on the ground organization, your legislation absolutely has had a tremendous impact and really um, literally and figuratively changing the, the face of, of the outdoors in our environment. Yes. Others? All right. I'll have a, I have a question. It's so, I want to echo so much of what Les just articulated so well. And as someone who lives in New Mexico, I, I just want to thank you for your leadership. It is such an inspiration every day. And as someone who works within the Outdoor Recreation Division in this great state of New Mexico, you make my job so much more inspirational um, and impactful. So thank you for that. I wanted to circle back on the Great American Outdoors Act and the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Obviously it's already had such an impact in this state. 
but I'm curious what you would like to see New Mexico do to make sure it takes full advantage of this incredible opportunity. What's your perspective from the federal level? And again, thank you for all the work that you did to make that, that bill into reality, into law. Thank you. And I mean, look, let's consider what the Great American Outdoors Act will do. It'll fund and support the enhancement of parks and recreational access for local communities throughout the country. Um, that tells me that we want everyone to weigh in, right? We want public support. Where, where do our communities want this funding to go? And, and you know, how can we take advantage of it in the best possible way? Uh, it also supports the recreation economy, which contributes $778 billion in national economic output annually and supports 5.2 million American jobs. If anyone tries to tell us that New Mexico doesn't have opportunities to create jobs by protecting our environment, I really think that, um, you know, I, I have a way to, uh, to contrast that, right? Uh, um, we can address climate change by protecting and supporting intact natural landscapes, fragile ecosystems, important wildlife habitats and eco service, ecosystem services that Americans depend on. And also, um, one last thing, um, it allocates $22 billion to federal land management agencies to address deferred maintenance on public lands. Uh, that, if that won't create jobs, I don't know what will. I think there is um, a tremendous um, economy in protecting our environment, in moving toward renewable energy, in uh, making sure that we're all on the same page with protecting our planet, planet from climate change. And uh, some of the legislation that we're moving through um, will absolutely help us to do that. So I think we need to take full advantage of everything that, you know, that every piece of legislation that we're moving through, uh, but certain, certainly the Great American Outdoors Act is, is something I think that will, will be terrific for New Mexico. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Well, oh, please, Mike, go oh, ahead. Oh, no, I was just, oh, I was just gonna uh, applaud you for, for your leadership. And, you know, here in Oklahoma, you know, just to the east, we, you know, this is something that, um, we can certainly learn from, and, and you know, we're in the, the the we're kind of in that culture building phase right now, really building and developing outdoor culture. We've got, and this is something I'll talk about later. But you know, we have you know, mile for mile, we have you know, we have surprising to many people, we have the most diverse terrain and eco regions. But I, you know, our our communities, our, our the public doesn't like fully, I think, appreciate that, and I think these types of opportunities are going to help us as we kind of really try to advance the outdoors and outdoor culture in our state. Absolutely. And Mike, that's an excellent segue in, and you're actually up next for oh. our next question. Um, and then we'll turn to Les for a similar question, but in your experience at Oklahoma City Boathouse and in your working community, um, you know, your, your both, you know, your program and the program that um, Les overseas in San Diego, they're very different, but they both are illustrations of what success looks like when we're talking about incorporating an advocacy and policy lens. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you're doing that in Oklahoma City, how you're leveraging public sector dollars, how you're building relationships, how you're engaging youth, because it is so interrelated. Yeah, it really is. And it's been a, it's been quite a process here. As I'd mentioned, we're in the culture building phase here. And, you know, so many people in in Oklahoma City, you know, the, grew up here not thinking in terms of the fact that, gosh, we have a lot to do outside here. And, and we have lakes, we have parks, we have trails. We're only an hour away from mountains. But yet it isn't wasn't such a, a big, robust part of our culture here. And so we've been spending the last, you know, 10 years on really trying to create gateways and pathways to orient kids and, and their and parents. We feel like if we get the kids engaged, their parents also engage and follow. And, and so it's been step by step, really breaking down barriers. Um, obviously, we're, we're centered around the river. We have an urban waterway right through Oklahoma City. 
that frankly was, was a dividing line for decades. And we thought, you know, why does this have to be a dividing line? Well, first we, we were able to leverage public support. It was a, really a public-private partnership we, through a program we call MAPS, Metropolitan Area Projects, where the public, I think, bought into the idea, we need to make a change. We've got to create more ways to improve quality of life, but also look at health and wellness. And again, I think ultra outdoor culture is a part of that, but so it was getting low water dams on our, on our river. Then it was up to us to program and activate the river. It, you know, you couldn't just have water. We had to do something with it. And believe me, people didn't know a lot about rowing and paddle sports and things like that. And, but what we tried to do is, is make it again, completely accessible to all and form alliances and partnerships across Oklahoma City. And then through the Thrive Initiative, it really has continued to really underscore that effort where we, we work with like, for example, the Native American community that is such an important part of Oklahoma and frankly has such a, a cultural tie to the water and canoeing, you know? And the fact that maybe this generation wasn't really connected to that aspect, to paddle, paddling, well, we are now an Olympic training site for paddle sports and rowing, and we're building the, uh, the first Americans Museum on the banks of the Oklahoma River. So that's an example of how we've, we're forming these partnerships that can help activate and inspire kids to be involved. And then, you know, similarly with the Hispanic uh, population just on the south side of the river and how we've created rowing programs that have gotten kids involved, um, whitewater programs, which is, you know, we, uh, I think what has happened from a public uh, policy and public engagement perspective, we took pieces of this vision and tried to find success and use that success to leverage the next thing. No one ever thought they would see a river full of kayaks or having kids of, of all colors and backgrounds and socioeconomic, you know, uh, sectors of the community to be on the water, but it's happening. Um, and those things led to the idea of, well, the idea of whitewater rafting in Oklahoma City seemed like a completely crazy idea, but the public bought into that because they saw the, the, the steps that we took. And so we were able to, to get an initiative passed that not only helped build a world-class whitewater facility, but, but also built trails throughout Oklahoma City and made improvements to parks and other in other sectors and other parts of the community that really has helped us advance this idea of outdoor culture. We've talked with our governor, our lieutenant governor about, you know, eventually creating an office of outdoor recreation at a state level and, and frankly doing things like creating a statewide network of paddle trails or water trails and things that can showcase the ability and the, the accessibility to the great outdoors and all the resources that we have in our state that maybe frankly people weren't totally connected to now certainly hunting and fishing and you know that has been part of our culture but paddling and climbing and hiking and you know more and more people are doing it but the more we can spotlight this incredible opportunity inspire kids at a young age to get involved which is our mission we think parents will do so and over time that creates a general generational impact which in turn also allows us to advance some legislative initiatives that will help out. For example, we've launched a program called River Protectors to, to help advance uh, people's awareness. So let's, we've got this great world-class waterway now that was a ditch before. How do we protect it? How do we get kids to take ownership and parents? And how does that spread throughout the state through all our waterways and, and bodies of water? So, you know, that's kind of a, an example of, of what we're doing and, and um, we feel like we're making some good impact and, and getting people, I guess we see more people driving around with kayaks in their cars and, you know, more kids, you know, on their bikes, on the trails. So, you know, there's a lot of signs that we're moving in the right direction. Pretty soon, Mike, you'll have folks pulling up with their skis on their hoods and the <laughs> well, that, that, yeah. imagine that in Oklahoma City, that's happening. It's so well, cool. it's funny. You, I don't know if you knew this, but imagine that is our new state uh, slogan. So imagine oh, that. So yeah. So we, finger on it. yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we are introducing skiing to Oklahoma, to, to our venue uh, next year. Oh, so yes, trying to offer something for everyone. So cool.
Um, Les, I'd like to ask you a similar question. You know, you all are doing a lot in this space and engaging the youth participants in your community, taking them up to the Capitol. Can you share a little bit about your experiences and, and how the work is unfolding in, in San Diego and throughout California? Yeah, absolutely. But first, I'd like to say I, I absolutely love kayaking and I, I definitely need to take a trip out to Oklahoma to, to enjoy that as well. You're always welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> yeah, a little a little bit about our organization. So, I mean, after outreach, we've we've been here in San Diego over the past twenty years, and really our focus has always been on introducing youth to the transformative power of the outdoors in order to help build their resilience. Um, and and a key part of our focus as an organization is on the health and the well being effects of of being in those outdoor spaces. Um, for so many of the youth that that we work with, and similar to to what Mike had shared. So many of our youth um, here in San Diego, especially in inner city San Diego, Southeast, um, Barrio Logan, those areas live so close to the coast and have never touched sand or live so close to mission trails or could, you know, in a, in a quick drive, get out to Cuyamaca Rancho State Park and be able to enjoy those outdoor spaces. But because of lack of transportation or other barriers to accessing these spaces, have never been. And so programs like ours across the state and across the country help to introduce youth um, to those spaces in many cases for the first time and really create that powerful experience, that powerful connection to the outdoors, um, not just, you know, recreating for the sake of recreating, but in those, in those moments, those, the, the, those youth are learning perspective, they're learning leadership, they're learning communication, they're, they're connecting with others in these deep, powerful ways uh, that, that, that helps to build their confidence, it helps them to explore their world in different ways, and it helps to grow their affinity to those spaces. And that's so important because then the next part of our model is well, after engaging thousands of youth in the outdoors each year, our hope is that that affinity then leads them to bring others into the outdoors. And we see that happening often through our leadership program. Many of our leadership program graduates then go on to become instructors or outdoor educators and help to lead other kids into the outdoors um, through, through similar experiences. But then other leadership program participants also go on um, to serve as uh, to serve as advocates or champions for those spaces as well, and so our youth are regulars to to Sacramento, working in close collaboration with state parks and with the Natural Resources Agency to help inform um, to help inform a the, the need for for more programs like ours to help inform what our state does in, in terms of climate action and climate change um, to help inform what the state does um, with funds such as the Prop 68 funding to help, uh, to help support park development and park core neighborhoods. Um, and through, the, through, uh, through opportunities like those, they're helping to then cultivate the, uh, cultivate the outdoors for a new, um, even more diverse generation of youth to, to also enter and to feel welcome in. Um, and so some, some of the key pieces of legislation that, that our youth have been directly connected to championing or really bring awareness to or working closely with agencies um, on has been Prop 68, the, one of the, the largest investments by the state um, through a state bond, uh, for, uh, uh, I believe just about $4 billion, um, bringing that into uh, to help support park development in our community. AB 209 was a huge piece of legislation that prioritized outdoor equity, um, an outdoor uh, equity grant program that will be coming through state parks and, and um, then also informing um, how funding is used such as Prop 64, which was our marijuana uh, tax um, and helping to direct that funding um, to support youth community access programs um, in a really powerful way and to, to help fund programs that, that help to reduce the likelihood of substance, the substance use for youth um, and really create alternative opportunities for, for them to, to recreate um, through the outdoors. And so our youth are such a key part of advocacy um, and, and 
I mean, they will be the champions. They will be the ones that will be the champions for conservation um, and environmental protections in the future. And so those initial experiences, those initial formative experiences in the outdoors um, is so powerful in, in really doing that. That's fantastic, great work. Matthew, and you're, you know, we're going to dig into a little bit more specifically the work that you're doing at your department um, within the partnerships program, but do you have anything to add to Les's sort of overview? I know that you all are both in California, so I wanted to create some space there for you to weigh in. Sure, I think um, like one of the things that uh, Les touched on was the grants that are coming out of um, Proposition 68, which was passed by the voters and <clears throat> provided um, several billion dollars in funds for, for parks in California. And one of the grant programs coming out of that is, you know, the development or redevelopment of park spaces, not just state parks, but at every level, every, every civic level within the state. And part of that grant process, when applicants have submitted, has been to show how they're engaging the community in the um, development of that grant and what the uh, what they want for the outcomes out of that grant and in my background which i'll go into a little bit more later i think that that's one of the more important things that you can do to ensure success to reach a more diverse uh, population and reach and, and reach out to individuals that may not be utilizing those resources to, to make them feel or not make them feel it's the wrong way but have them be a part of the process and ownership of it so i think that's been a real win um, out of all of this and has been part of a culture shift in general that's great less uh, did were you gonna no okay congresswoman holland how you know so much of the work um at the state level and the federal level, and even to a certain degree at the at the local municipal level are interrelated. How would you say the work that's being done and the progress being made around state policy informs you um, in your role at the federal level? How do you see that relationship? Oh, well, it's, it's absolutely important. And um, I mean, look, we, as a delegation, we have regular calls with Governor Lujan Grisham uh, and, um, and I feel like if it wasn't about the pandemic, right, because that's the big issue right now, and we're all working very hard to try to get past that, um, we would have so many other issues that we're discussing. And um, when we think about the role that local, um, you know, local city councilors, county commissioners, uh, land commissioner, um, all these folks play a role in making sure that we are uh, moving forward the things that we need to, uh, because they're on the ground in their areas, right? We want local communities to have a say in how we're, we're moving these things forward. Um, you know, I've, there, there are several uh, national parks uh, really in my district uh, that, you know, might take you 15 minutes to get to. Um, e you know, they're close by and we feel like we just need to make sure that we can get kids to those places. They're close by. There's a wildlife refuge in the South Valley. And then we have Petroglyph National Park in my district. So many trails, so many ways for our children to be outdoors. It's up to us to, to find ways to make sure that they get there. And when we're working with, um, you know, with the folks on the ground, then, you know, we can let them know every, every year also, we have a grant writing workshop. Um, you, it, it's usually myself and Senator Martin Heinrich who, who jointly have a grant writing workshop so that every, you know, these organizations uh, know how to uh, find, um, any, uh, uh, they know how to find the grants that they can apply to. And also uh, they have the support to make sure that they're writing the grants properly and that they get their support letters from us and so forth. So uh, we work, I feel like it's important to have that partnership um, because then we're able to uh, make sure that the money that we're allocating, the you know, the, the appropriations that we are putting forth 
are getting to the folks who need it and and it's going to a you know the best possible place absolutely well your office is is very good at that and perhaps i'm biased because i am in your district but making those connections has been something that you all have been fantastic you and your team so thank you for that too and I'll, let me just add this one last thing. You know, the Valle del Oro Wildlife Refuge, it, it was a dairy farm at one time, right? It used to be a dairy farm and now it's a national wildlife refuge. We, I mean, those are, those are partnerships that, um, that are important, right? And, and so it's up to us to make sure that we are uh, building those relationships so that we can know, uh, you know, take advantage of opportunities like that. Absolutely. Mike, were you going to weigh in? It looked like you were oh. signaling. <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, I totally agree with, with all of those things. Um, again, it, as, as the Congressman mentioned about the, you know, we have, we have a similar circumstance, you know, we have a wildlife refuge. It's really close, you know, here to downtown, but again, how do we get the kids out there? How do we expose that? You know, it's just within 15 minutes of your house. You've got you're in the great out. You're 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 completely remote. So that's something that we're very passionate about. You know, continuing in in and I think I was going to mention too that you know the outdoor through the outdoor foundation. You know, we've really you know really uh, embraced this collective impact you know uh, initiative and in that you know we find that there's so many people, you know, on the same page, they're doing it in their own way and bringing everyone together from the Latino community development agency in our world or the, uh, or the different Native American groups, um, the YMCA. Uh, we found that collective effort, you know, that collective effort has really helped us problem solve in some of these cases and made our voice, you know, much louder. So I, I would say that's been very, very successful over the past you know, couple of years as we've developed those partnerships to move, move the needle. You know? Thank you. That's wonderful to hear. I'm a big fan of collective impact. Yeah. <laughs> Axie, um, you know, New Mexico is one of fewer than a dozen states to have statutorily created um, an Office of Outdoor Recreation and the Outdoor Equity Fund. So, in your experience here in New Mexico and in working with other similar state offices, what excites you about the possibility and the opportunities for this state office within, within sort of the context of increasing outdoor participation? And what are you seeing sort of others doing? Um, what could be done in other states um, or what could be done in New Mexico um, that other states are doing well? Oh man, I don't even know where to start with what excites me because I feel like the sky's the limit here in New Mexico and to echo part of the conversation um, in the question previously, I just wanna say our, our federal delegation is amazing to work with. Uh, Representative Holland's office, Senator Heinrich, um, Representative Ben Ray Lujan and now Senator Ben Ray Lujan, they show up every day. Uh, and I have stories from New Mexicans across this state who say, you know, they've been fishing with Martin Heinrich not too long ago. And they were talking about how they were actually gonna implement land and water conservation fund money in a specific county in our state. And I just use that as one example to say that, you know, our leadership across all levels, including um, and maybe epitomizing at the federal level is there for New Mexicans. And that's one of the things that gets me really excited. But of course, the Outdoor Equity Fund. So the Outdoor Equity Fund became law in April of last year. And I believe New Mexico was the first state to statutorily create such a thing. And it was organic. It came about because of New Mexican leadership. New Mexican leadership in the southern part of the state, in Doña Ana County. State Representative Angelica Rubio was a huge proponent and advocate for that someone I look up to every single day and someone who has fought for equitable outdoor access for our young people for decades. Uh, Las Cruces City Councilor Gabe Vasquez was right there with her to make this happen. People who have, you know, New Mexican dirt under their fingernails and who are out there on the lands and waters doing the work that they are championing. And then of course our governor as well, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham is who signed this bill into law in April. And so it's a grant that invests in programming 
transformative outdoor recreation. Um, I believe Les also used the word transformative and I love that. We, we definitely want to follow that lead, you know, so it's, it's investing in transformative outdoor recreation for our young people, many of whom primarily for this particular program come from low income communities. One example, Mil Abrazos is a nonprofit that was awarded one of our first outdoor equity fund grants. And what they are doing is getting young kids in middle and high school out onto the acequias, acequias in their community. So kids are learning about this ancient form of irrigation um, that maybe they grew up practicing, they have roots on with their family, and now there's an opportunity to continue that work through formal programming. And so I really, I think the, the big picture is that it's not really about outdoor recreation. Outdoor recreation is a vehicle here for these conversations in this work in social justice, climate justice, public health, uh, and equity, equity, not equality. And so really it is about an intentional refocusing of state resources to make sure that we are tackling that conversation. How do we equitably increase access to the outdoors? What resources can the state bring to bear to lower lower those barriers. Other work that you know I find really impressive, it's really exciting that Les and Matt are on this call. Proposition 98 is, or Proposition 68, excuse me, um, is so amazing. We've been following that from the ground in New Mexico. Uh, amazing that I hear there's 19 million earmarked towards that AB 209. Super inspiring to see that work going on in California. Um, and I'd love to have New Mexico and California continue to lead this conversation nationally and push other states towards this ultimate outcome of every state having an outdoor equity fund or, or something that works for them. You know, it, it has to be organic. I think that's so important in New Mexico and I think it would be important in every state, but I really do see New Mexico and California as leading the way there. And, you know, I think we're gonna start to see that just domino effect as, as more states recognize how important this is for outdoor recreation, yes, but it's also much more holistic than that. Absolutely. Do folks have anything to add or questions to ask Axie? I think that that piece around the outdoor recreation work really being a vehicle for the broader outcomes that you know our communities so, so much need um, is really an important point. So thank you for bringing that up to Axie. Um, Matthew, within the partnerships division at California State Parks, you all really are taking um, an innovative approach to building partnerships cross sector. So, you know, partnerships with private industry, public sector partnerships, um, you know, volunteer and nonprofits um, in order to really increase outdoor participation. So as a state governmental entity, what learnings can you share about what is working in this space um, to increase outdoor participation, particularly among diverse communities? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so um, I'm relatively new to, to state parks. I've been here less than two years, which in state park world is a very short period of time. <laughs> and I'm only bringing that up because I recently came from public health which is um, where I was at for quite a bit of time. And when I, I was super excited to be able to come on board with state parks because I just see the, the two different um, missions are really met, are connected to each other, public health and outdoor spaces and state parks. And when I worked at um, public health, um, my main emphasis of my work was um, providing services to underserved um, populations. And I think that um, one of the challenges that um, that is hard to overcome is that public spaces are, they're supposed to be for everybody, right? But um, what I, in my work in public health and then in our challenges within state parks is people that are already going to public spaces feel comfortable in those spaces and they they feel ownership of those spaces. And the people that aren't accessing them are not accessing them for a myriad of reasons, whether it's you know transportation issues or um, they don't see themselves reflected in those spaces or they don't feel safe in those spaces. So within partnerships, um, like one of the main things that we've been working on is um, out of um, uh, 
process that we called transformation, <laughs> which was born out of a different crisis back in 08, the financial crisis was a catalyst for a lot of changes within, um, within state parks. And there were recommendations out of that and partnerships was created um, from that. And although state parks has relied heavily on partnerships since its inception, Semper Virens Fund started saving redwood groves a century ago, and we're still partners with them. Um, out of transformation, the legislature um, statutorily um, uh, created a partner for us um, or, or gave us authorization to create a partner um, where to help streamline pro processes and, and create opportunities to enhance um, a myriad of different um, uh, programs, um, including access. And out of that process, we are um, now working with an organization called Parks California. And um, they're relatively new. They were really, they're only less than two years old, but it's a different type of relationship than some of our traditional partners who we continue to highly value and that we are connected at the hip. They are they were created to support state parks. And um, so some of the things that have come out of Parks California just in the last few months are, are grants for transportation to state parks to serve um, communities that don't usually or don't often or regularly um, access state parks. Um, we're also um, wrapping up um, our process with them on setting their priorities for 2021, and then um, outlining the projects that will will unfurl um, through Parks California, and they will they will be taking on different projects that it would be extremely difficult as us as a state agency to take on, um, either through acquiring resources or um, hiring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then working collaboratively with us as a department to move those projects forward throughout the state. So that's one way that we've been trying to move forward through partnerships. Um, and there, there's a myriad of other, other ways I'm sure I could get into, but I don't know if, <clears throat> if you have any other questions on that or. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. Les, since you're in California too, I'm interested to hear a little bit about how outdoor outreach works directly with the public sector and the parks department in particular. Um, my understanding is that you do to a certain degree. And so maybe you can, since we have, um, you know, you both on from California, it would be great to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would, I would echo what, what Matthew had, had shared also. Um, and some just some of the the incredible work that the state the states state parks has been doing um, in that transformation process and in, in engaging the broader community in conversations around equitable access. Um, we've been super grateful to to be at the table with state parks and and discussing how um, how how we might create or develop a community access park partnership that that opens more channels like that to, to work with local nonprofit organizations that are helping to create those initial transformative experiences for youth. And so it's been, it's been an excellent process working, working closely with state parks. Um, and we're, we're encouraged also um, by the new leadership coming in, Director Armando Quintero um, and his vision around park, uh, park equity and workforce development. Um, and how that how that aligns to creating more inclusive outdoors. Absolutely, that's great. Well, I know we are getting close to time. I do have one final question for the full panel, and um, you know, recognizing that those who are going to be attending, who are you know tuning in to listen to this conversation, are folks that are working in the outdoor industry, potentially working in the brand space, retailers, manufacturers. So folks might be wondering, you know, how they can support this work, where they can engage. Um, do you all have thoughts on what, you know, what folks in the outdoor industry can do to support both on the policy side as well as on the direct engagement side? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll jump forward here. <laughs> so 
from from our perspective, you know, again, I started this, but you know, my comments by talking about how we are, again, really trying to, you know, to to develop that core outdoor culture in Oklahoma to 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 bring attention to the opportunities there are for the public to engage in the outdoors, inspire people to get outside. And, and so I think, you know, so, so often it can be people don't know what's in their own backyard, they get engaged, then they become advocates, then that leads to other change and legislative, you know, down the road impacts. And so, you know, I saw this, like, for example, REI came to our city last year. They, they in, in, frankly, in talking, I'd been trying to interest REI in coming to Oklahoma for a while, just in my own efforts. And, you know, I think so often that sometimes, you know, we didn't don't fit in that typical box of a place that people associate with, you know, outdoor, you know, that traditional outdoor culture or that engagement. And yet I feel like we're kind of a sleeping giant in that regard in terms of all the opportunities here. And what I found is through that, it's almost become, you know, that, that store is busy. I mean, more and more people are coming and getting engaged and I think are, are seeing and it's opening their eyes up to the fact that, you know, we really do have some really cool, you know, resources and assets here. So I think just, you know, in our case, it would be how do we bring exposure and inspire people that, you know, people love to, to you know, go buy the, you know, the shoes or the, you know, the, the, the jackets and things like that, but to understand that, you know, you don't have to go to Colorado, that you have this in your own backyard. Um, and and how, do we, how do we bring attention to that here? So we saw it happen with REI and, and, and we've got a great partnership with them. And I think that can continue and, and get more, more people engaged. So. A great example. Others? I, I, could, I could probably weigh in a, l a little bit in thinking about this um, Industry and manufacturers, they have tremendous influence. Uh, they know where their raw materials come from, how they're sourced, who works for them, under what conditions, uh, right? These are all issues that are, co that are essentially coming to a head now during this, uh, uh, co these conversations about uh, racial inequity, racial inequality, environmental justice, and you know things that we're we're talking about right now. Um, as consumers, we need to study what the manufacturers practice and know. Um, and I know this can be clouded and difficult to ascertain sometimes, but uh, I think we need to keep prompting the questions and make sound decisions about who we purchase our goods from and um, you know how they're sourced and, and that kind of thing. Um, I'll give you an example, and this is an issue that we're working on right now. Uh, I mentioned it in my remarks, place names. Um, you know, there are too many places and geographic features around the country that still have names that are racial slurs or derogatory terms which make visitors feel uncomfortable and discourage them from enjoying the outdoors. And we know there are products manufactured to promote those places. I feel like there's an absolute um, opportunity for us to, uh, to, you know, to talk about these issues with the manufacturers, to, to have them weigh in on some of these issues. Um, and I have a, you know, we have a bill for that, I should say. Uh, my Reconciliation and Place Names Act would essentially expedite cumbersome processes that we have for renaming places and create a body to recommend places to be renamed. Um, and so I, I think that there's a lot of conversations happening right now uh, where uh, manufacturers and industry leaders uh, can have a voice and where we can, um, you know, come to some, I guess, partnerships. Absolutely. I know that the Outdoor Industry Association is doing a tremendous amount of work on the governmental affairs front to do just that and to engage industry and connect with policymakers too. So that's a fantastic example, Representative. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I am cognizant of time and I just want to thank you all. Um, unless anybody has any pressing thoughts or final remarks. Yeah, Stephanie, I'll, I'll, I'll add also just briefly. Um, I think I think you know some of what you've heard throughout throughout this conversation also is just how intersectional um, you know the movement to make the outdoors more inclusive really is, and it, it really requires 
champions in the legislature, champions in government agencies and state parks across sectors as well. And, and Matthew, I'd love to talk more about just your experience in, in public health as well and how public health ties into this. Um, and, and, um, and then also bringing in outdoor retailers as well in the outdoor industry. Some of the, some of the conversations that we've been having around that is in, in order to create a more inclusive outdoors, we have to think about that holistic experience before a youth or individual even experiences those spaces. And so we've been working closely, for example, with, uh, with the North Face through their Explore Fund over the past 10 years, uh, most recently with Hoka and Decker brands. And what, and, and those are just two examples, but what both of them had commit, have committed to is not only funding the work of organizations like ours, but taking it a step further and really, really reflecting on how can we create a more diverse workforce through partnerships like this? How could we, you know, work with outdoor outreach and their leadership program to present opportunities for youth to see themselves in outdoor retail or to see themselves in land management? We're working closely with state parks as well. Um, in developing those internship opportunities. And so I, I would encourage also the outdoor industry to really reflect on, you know, what are some of the ways even beyond funding that we can help to create a more, a more intentional, intentionally inclusive um, outdoor space. Just to jump, jump in on, on that really quick. I know we need to wrap up, but you know, that's something I really take to heart because here again, we feel like our, we're really trying to target, you know, we operate whitewater, a whitewater venue, we operate ropes courses and in all these outdoor adventure activities. And we want our workforce to come from the surrounding community. So, you know, so that kids will look up to these kids, they're mentors. And so, so we've been really working on and really, you know, building a diverse workforce in the, in our outdoor adventure activities and so it's it's something it's an ongoing process but we already see the benefits of that that's great well i can't top that so <laughs> thank you all for your work thank you for being here today for those tuning in please check out the lineup of outdoor retailer education sessions and the outdoor industry association booth all right be well everyone